Hi everyone. Thanks so much for coming to today's Authors at Google event. It is my pleasure to introduce Greg Zachary, uh, who is here to talk about his book, Married to Africa, A Love Story. Greg is a former foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal and went to Africa in 2001 to write a novel. Um, I'll let him tell the rest of that story. So the Kirkus Review calls um, Married to Africa a witty tale of opposites attracted and an illuminating portrait of African and American daily lives. Please join me in welcoming Greg Zachary. Well, thank you very much. So um, before I forget, I want to thank a few people. One is Eric Schmidt, who is always very attentive to journalists, if you haven't noticed. And so uh, I also want to thank Lisa and, and uh, Google. Um, I must say, while I was writing the book, I was thinking about coming and getting a lunch at Google out of this. And, and you know, authors have many motivations. Increasingly, money is not one of them. And so, writing the book, I, I, I had a few, few dreams, and this was one of them. Um, also, I was quite amazed that I came the same week as Magic Johnson. Because, while I don't write about it in this book, I played basketball in Africa, even at my advanced age. And I remember just torching some people in a makeshift court in Accra, Ghana, where I met my wife. I was like a mini Larry Bird. So Larry Bird was the guy Magic played against. And no kidding, in a course of an afternoon, I demolished every player in Accra. They tore the court down the next day. I am not kidding. No one ever played on that court again. So um, to, to come the same week as Magic was a real was a real thrill. Um, the last thing I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna say is that um, there's a lot that I read about aid to Africa, how to help Africa, and I have a personal philosophy that. Until we approach Africa as Americans in some kind of posture of mutual benefit, um, we may find that our um, efforts to quote unquote assist are, are less than we would like, are suboptimal. And I do think that while this is not a book about political economy, I spent a whole career writing about political economy and I still write about development in Africa. and. Um, one way of assisting an African is to marry one. One way of thinking about this book is as a kind of personal um, encounter with this interaction. And I think that too often people who aid Africans don't personally engage them at the same time and have a relationship of mutual benefit. Uh, I always thought a lot about what was I getting out of being in Africa because I didn't come there to be charitable or to convince myself that I was good. I actually might have been convincing other people that I was bad. So I went to Africa more as a person than as a representative of an ideal. And interestingly, you know, when Google announced recently that its foundation would perhaps take second, you know, to, to give seed some area to its business, I'm very impressed with what Google's doing in Africa because it's treating people as adults. It's looking for talent, and it's trying to build on what is already there. Too often people presume there's nothing of value, and yet in African cities there are creative people. I, I visited Nairobi and Google's team in Nairobi, very impressed with what they're trying to do and how they're trying to leverage the talent that's there. In some, so in some sense, there's a, there's a, um, um, a parallel to what's happened uh, for me. So I'm just going to read a short excerpt from this book, chapter 10, and um, it's, it's called Guess Who, the chapter, and it starts out, at long last I meet Chizo's parents, the parents of, of my wife. We are in Port Harcourt, the oil capital of Nigeria and the country's second largest city. It is a warm September evening and Chizo and I sit shoulder to shoulder on a wooden bench inside a dark windowless room large enough to fit two beds and a great number of plastic bags. 
Edith and Samuel, Chizo's parents, have rented this single room for the past 25 years. It has no running water, no bathroom, no kitchen. Her parents cook and bathe outside in a courtyard they share with about a dozen other families who also live in windowless rooms. Two kerosene lamps illuminate the room in which Chizo's parents live. Two bare light bulbs hang from the ceiling, but the power is out or maybe the bulbs are dead. I don't ask. I don't want to ask questions. I don't want to draw attention to the poverty of Chizo's parents. I don't want to reveal my shock over finding them in these conditions. Chizo had told me her parents were poor, but I am still shaken by seeing them in these rough quarters. I realize I am staring at her parents with my mouth wide open. Embarrassed, I look down at the dirty concrete floor. Chizo nudges me. Feel your eyes, she says. Go ahead. I lift my head and study Samuel, her father. He is a wiry man with deep set eyes, high cheekbones, and very dark skin. I am a photocopy of my father, Chizo once told me. I now see she looks like a female version of her father, only younger. He and Edith live in this room with three of their ch six children, two sons and a daughter. Chizo, their oldest daughter, and two married sisters live elsewhere. I know from Chizo that once all six children lived with their mother and father here. Only Chizo escaped when her grandmother invited her at age of 10 to live in a spacious, clean, and well-ventilated house in a university town in Nigeria called Oweri. Chizo came of age in Oweri, doted on by a loving grandmother. Lucky her. Her brothers and sisters remained in this room sharing the two mattresses at night with their mother and father and somehow coexisting during wake waking hours. Seven of them jammed together. All of her siblings now crowd into this room looking me over. Our arrival is a big event and Chizo's two married sisters have traveled by bus to be here. Everyone is quiet. Everyone looks at me. I feel their eyes. I am the first European or American, to put it bluntly, the first white ever to sit in this room. Everyone seems to be waiting for me to speak. I say nothing and my silence makes the room seem smaller. I hunch over and grip the wooden bench with my hands. I hold the bench tightly out of fear that otherwise I will either bolt from the room or collapse on the dirty linoleum that covers the concrete floor. Chizo breaks the silence. She explains to her family that business brings me, her American boyfriend, to Nigeria. She talks in a mixture of Igbo, her local language, and English. I am working on an assignment for Amnesty International, she explains, accompanying a staff researcher from the Group's, group's London office on a tour of Nigeria's oil-producing Delta region. The goal is to produce a report on human rights, oil companies, and the government, because there's a lot of conflict in this area, and it continues to this day. This visit is back in 2002, five, seven years ago. So Chizo goes on to describe the work I do, where I do it, who I am, where I came from, how we met, where we live in Accra, and something of the life we share. She goes on for a long time, actually, and is still going strong when Stam Samuel interrupts her. When did my daughter become a big parrot, he says. Chizo says nothing. Her sisters laugh. You talk like the whites now, Samuel says. Have you forgotten that the quietest women are the most desired? <laughs> that still strikes me as a funny line. Uh, Chizo doesn't answer. He points to her Rasta-style braids, her dreadlocks. What have you done to your hair? Can't you straighten it the way you used to? Her sisters shift nervously. He pauses, looking at her, demanding an answer. I'm living a natural life now, she says. Hair, skin, everything. Why, Samuel asks. I love my blackness, she says. My skin, my hair, everything black, I love it all. Why, he repeats. He makes me live a natural life, she says, and points at me. He is why I love my blackness. I am stunned by her confession, but fear that Samuel will blame me for the changes in his daughter's appearance. Chizo doesn't give him the chance. You will shut up your mouth a little, father, and stop acting like an uncivilized man from the village. Don't disrespect me, he says. I will do more than that. I want you to be crying. 
I am proud of Chizo for defending herself, but I want to avoid a family battle, at least not until I've done what I've come to do. Kedu, I say to Samuel, offering the all-purpose Ibo greeting while squeezing Chizo's hand. Kedu, Samuel replies. Kedu, I repeat, my eyes now scanning the room, connecting with everyone, feeling them with my eyes, taking in their smiles. I've taken the focus off Chizo and brought myself back to center stage. I feel a surge of confidence and tell myself I've got the situation under control. Afron Genaya, I say, continuing in Igbo. My words mean I love you in English. The sisters laugh and I kiss Chizo on the cheek, smacking my lips theatrically so that they know for sure I mean to say that I love her, not all of them. On seeing me kiss Chizo, Edith and Samuel rock back and forth, their mouths wide open. I am here to tell you an important story, I say, speaking English now, having exhausted my Igbo vocabulary. I lean towards Samuel because he is, after all, my principal audience. I love your daughter and I plan to marry her, I say. She will come with me to America and we will marry in America according to the rules of the U.S. government. I go on to say that Chizo and I will keep our house in Accra, Ghana, until her visa is issued. Since I have, to, have yet to apply for Chizo's visa, I expect to do so soon, I explain that she won't leave for America for at least a year. She will visit Port Harcourt again before she travels to the States, I say. I wonder whether anyone understands me. Am I speaking too quickly? Chizo sighs and looks, and looking at her parents says, this is what I want. Her parents remain silent. Chizo then utters a phrase in Igbo. Her father takes a long breath, clears his throat, and rises from his seat. You may marry her, he says. I thank him and say I am pleased to receive his approval. From a plastic bag, I, re I remove the, ni the bottle of Nigerian-made whiskey that Chizo told me to bring along. The Nigerians call this local whiskey schnapps because Europeans planted a taste in these parts for a scented brew. I give Samuel the bottle. Edith rises to her feet and grabs two small glasses and hands them to Samuel. He pours me a full glass and then pours himself one too. We touch glasses and down the whiskey. The whiskey is harsh and I cough loudly. He smiles and our eyes meet. I'm happy you are marrying my daughter, he says. But tell me, what does your first wife think of my daughter? Will she welcome Chizo into your family in America? Will Chizo have her own house to live in? Or will she share the same house with your other wife? My other wife? My jaw tightens and I suppress a nervous smile. I motion for Samuel to pour me another glass of whiskey. Chizo shifts uneasily on the bench and I squeeze her hand. Samuel hands me a full glass and I sip from it and then kiss Chizo on the lips, quieting her and making a loud smacking noise when my lips retreat. Her mother squirms, and I wonder whether the whiskey is starting to talk. Samuel stares straight at me, and I calculate how much about American romance I should explain to him. From his question, I know I must tell him firmly and clearly that I have no other wife. I have Chizo only, I say. I have no other wife, only her. In America, she alone will be my wife. I sip my whiskey again and hold Chizo's hand, waiting for the room to erupt in cheers. Perhaps I have failed to make my position clear. Tell no lies in my house, Samuel says. There is no shame in admitting to having another wife. I have only one wife because I cannot afford to have more. You, white man with your wealth, you can have many wives. You can even have other African wives. Hmm. I look at Edith, who has been staring at me, her mouth open. And when our eyes meet, she looks away. I wonder if her husband embarrasses her. I must remember to ask Chizo later. I wonder whether Chizo should explain the real situation to her father, but I decide I must. Now I'm afraid, realizing that all along I've been out of my depth, I down another glass of whiskey, rise to my feet, and take two short steps toward Samuel. I grab his right hand and pull him toward me. He lets his body fall into mine, and the two of us are standing, eye to eye, nose to nose, holding one another. I edge back, creating some space between us, then take his hand. In West Africa, male friends often hold hands in public. I am making a conciliatory gesture, I think, not an intimate one. Chizo helps by pulling out a disposable camera and snapping the two of us standing arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder. Samuel, your daughter is my only wife, my one and only wife. 
In America, we have one wife, one wife only, one wife at a time, only one. Only one, he says. Yes, only one. I accept, he says. I want to shout out hooray, but instead I pour whiskey for Chizo's two brothers who use the same glasses that Samuel and I have used. I have drunk enough and start to worry about how Chizo and I will get back to our hotel. Perhaps my new Nigerian friend John will collect us. Otherwise, we will have to find a taxi on the dark streets and inevitably the driver will be a stranger and we will be vulnerable. Are you divorced, Samuel asks. I am. I am also divorced, he says. My first wife lives in Calabar. Calabar is a day's travel away. Samuel was raised there. He explains that neither he nor his wife, Edith, ever visit Calabar. They want to stay far away from his first wife, whom they fear will harm them if given the chance. Sounds like a good idea, I say. Samuel nods in agreement and asks, what will you do to protect my daughter from being killed by your first wife? Killed? By who? That's all I can say before going mute. <laughs> I suddenly feel dizzy. I fall away from Samuel and sit down next to Chizo. The room seems to be spinning. Is it the whiskey? Samuel remains on his feet and his voice is rising. We know you Americans enjoy killing people. How can I be sure you're not bringing her to America for your old wife to kill her? He sticks the index finger of his right hand into my belly and says, bang, bang. Samuel fears his ex-wife and his Edith does too. She tells Chizo this, is, this in Igbo and then Chizo tells me in English. Edith has soft brown eyes. Her face is fleshy and round. Her English is poor. She has nothing close to the facility possessed by her husband, who once worked for a British oil company. He was a pipeline security guard and still carries the nickname Little British. Edith won't go to Calabar, Samuel says. Never. I have a house there, a large house. He shakes his head, takes my hand, and draws me close to him. The sad part is I cannot protect her in Calabar. I assure Samuel that I will protect Chizo in America. He nods. Then Edith asks, are you Christian? No, I am not, I say. Edith is disappointed. I told you he is not Christian, Chizo says. He is Jewish. Jewish, she asks. What is Jewish? Chizo tells her mother in Igbo that being Jewish is like being Christian only without the worship of Jesus. Edith looks alarmed. Tears form in her eyes. She says something in Igbo. What did she say, I ask? She explains that her mother fears that without the help of Jesus, I may become a tool of the devil, even if I don't want to, because the devil is trickish. I tell Edith that the devil won't get me. Never. All she knows is Islam and Christianity, Chizo says of her mother. She thinks that if you aren't Christian or Muslim, you must follow Juju. I look Edith straight in the eyes. No Juju, I say. No. Chizo lets forth with a run another round of Igbo, supporting her words with a complex series of hand motions and facial expressions that, taken together, reassure her mother. She smiles. She pulls Chizo against her expansive body and begins to sing first softly and then louder until Chizo's three sisters join in the song. Chizo is singing too, softly, into my ear, our bodies pressed against her mother's ample body, the Igbo words unexpectedly soothing me. In the darkness, in the smallest home imaginable, I am being serenaded by a family of strangers in a language I can't comprehend. I feel confused, disoriented. Praise the Lord, I cry out. Everyone sings louder. Only Samuel is silent, watching me intently. Um, well, that's, that's chapter 10. And then I, I do tell a, a companion story in chapter 11 about um, Chizo meeting my mother, because my father, uh, she actually did meet my father too, uh, about meeting my parents. One of the things that is sort of a subtext of this chapter is that often we from America visit Africa with trepidation. Your Google Africa team hires their bodyguards or does whatever, but actually they're afraid of us. <laughs> you know, they think we're dangerous. And so, you know, one of the things I try to explore in this book is that we have these stereotypes as Africa as dangerous, as menacing, but in fact, we often seem menacing to them. And um, uh, I think that it, you know, it's worth reminding ourselves that while we may think of ourselves as good and helpful, 
other people think of themselves as having a good thing going, even if it has limitations. And so this sort of reversal, this idea that I might hurt their daughter rather than I was putting myself at risk, I think is interesting. It does upend your conventions of how we relate to these places. So in any case, what I thought I would do is just take some questions and um, you know, try to interact with you a little bit more, more individually if you have some questions even about how you might engage Sub-Saharan Africa in a more um, direct way. So, and if, uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes, all right? Okay, thanks. Anybody, anybody have any, any questions? Okay, well that's kind of, that's, oh, go ahead, there you go. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about differences between the um, people living in Accra, for instance, and more rural areas? Yeah, there is a very... Okay, can I, can I talk a little bit about the difference between the city and the countryside? And interestingly, the biggest gulf in African life is between the city and the country. And much more than the gulf, say, between the United States and an African city. So people living in African cities are exposed to a lot of the same influences we are. Um, but it's true that the rural areas um, might be completely alien, and even alien to Africans in the city. Um, my wife is really a creature of, of, of cities, and African cities have undergone a big transformation in the past 20, 25 years, both partly with the mobile phone, partly with the internet, and partly with the beginnings of a consumer society. Um, some of that initially was from remittances, or Africans living in the US and Europe coming back and establishing themselves um, in either part-time living or as retirees. Uh, one of the things that happened while I was in Accra in the early 2000s was that a home developer from Texas decided that Accra was a good market to build homes for these returning Ghanaians, or Ghanaians who wanted, who lived in the U.S., were U.S. citizens or naturalized, and they wanted a home there. And they built about 400 homes, probably around 200,000 apiece. So, you know, you started to see these cities become much more uh, cosmopolitan. So that's a good question. Um, I've done some work in rural villages, and it's um, it's very um, very different. So, thanks. <laughs> any yeah? You have any questions for anybody else? Um, well, what what drew some of you to this to this event, and have any of you been to Africa? Where have you been? Oh, did you? For the Google team? No, um, I work with a nonprofit photography group in San Francisco called First Exposure. Oh. And okay. they're based in Boston, and they have a Google team. And so they get kids from the Bay Area. Uh huh. And we teach them photography. So we took our six most experienced students to a talk, and we did a cultural exchange program with the Ghana Youth Voting Project. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you should, you, you know, it'd be interesting to. Uh, hear who you worked with there. Because some of the work I'm doing is on how Africans are documenting themselves and what they can do with greater documentation. And I was in Accra in September, so I'd be, I didn't run across that group. So it'd be nice to uh, get a, uh, I'm just at gperiodzachary at gmail.com. Okay. Yeah, that would be great to hear about that. One of the things I was looking at was these flip video cameras and trying to do low cost video more as documentation initially, but it's a similar concept, I think. Yeah. Anyone else been in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa? Okay. Well, I mean, South Africa is a special case, so, you know, They've had computer companies in Johannesburg, and IBM is there, and Microsoft for many years. So let's set them aside for a moment. Um, you know, Google chose initially to go into Nairobi. They also looked at um, Rwanda, 
Rwanda is an interesting, interesting place. Um, it has, you know, there's a group of countries with a lot of stability, high education, and a certain amount of IT professionals. So the cities Nairobi, Kampala in Uganda, Accra in Ghana, there's a number of cities in Nigeria that have booming IT businesses. Nigeria is a more difficult place to work. I know that um, it's easier to start an operation in Ghana, say. Um, Zambia, uh, where my friend Chanda Chasala from Lusaka is here. Lusaka is another place. Um, you know, in the francophone world, um, Senegal probably has uh, the most important IT cluster. Um, I think it's really useful to think about African development in terms of cities because in, in terms of absorbing technologies, the cities are where that capacity exists. And then the other thing is the, mel the mobile phone adoption has outstripped the internet so significantly that the internet is actually stagnating in Africa. One of the things that Google's confronting is that you need to leverage the mobile phone network if you really want to bring internet to a large group of people. This is sort of a cliche now, but it's much more difficult to get the development community to change. They spent 10 or 15 years pushing the internet, pushing the internet. And even in East Africa, they've been talking about the undersea cable coming there, and in West Africa, it's already come there. But really, the problem with the internet is twofold in Africa. Sure, transmission costs are high, or whatever you call it, broadband costs, whatever you want to label it. But on the push, on the, on the pull side, nobody has computers. So, but they've got t cell phones. You now have one in five Africans, let's say there's 650 million sub-Saharan Africans, one in five owns a cell phone. That includes the kids. Well, you've got 20% penetration of mobile phones, and you have 1% penetration of internet. And population is growing so fast in Africa that you have internet penetration is declining. The game is over. So ICON and all the groups that saw the internet as the leading edge in Africa, they made a colossal mistake. And a few of us told them so. But, um, you know, it's the Vodafones and the MTNs, and they're going to be the real internet slash communications people. And I think that um, Google has got actually a pretty good pretty good strategy in that, in that respect. And I think some of the older computer companies like Microsoft and IBM, HP, you know, they, they, they don't, they're a bit more yesterday, you know, in that regard. The mobile phone capabilities are, are potentially great. You can see television being broadcast over mobile phones because the capacity is there. They have to drive um, traffic over it. I mean, the capacity will be there over time. But the computers are never going to be there. And uh, so that's a, good, you know, that's a good thing, is to look at mobile communications and to look at cities. And every, those African cities I mentioned, I'd say about 50 to 75 world-class programmers are in each one. And another 500 to 1,000 um, computer people. People who have ability to write scripts and templates and, and some fluency with programming environments but they maybe don't have a master's degree in computer science, say, or they don't really write in, in uh, uh, C++ or something. Or, and so, but, but out of that 50 or 75, I think there's still, there's still some leverage that has not been you know, really, really understood yet. So that's a good, that's a good question. Okay, well, um, thanks very much, everybody, for letting me come, and uh, I hope you enjoy the book. Okay. <laughs>